Hello, Assalamu alaikum to our listening audience. I have, you know, been thinking about, you know, things come and with all issues in the United States, they come, everybody's talking about it for a moment. You look up and it disappeared and you wonder what happened because whoever it was happening to didn't disappear. And one of those issues is DACA. What happened to these young men and women who got here, were brought here by their parents? Where are they? Well, I have the opportunity and the honor to speak with Christopher Navarez Azdar, 23 years old, born in Durango, Mexico, came to the U.S. before the age of two. Oh, how does anybody remember that? He was, he is undocumented. And we're going to talk about what that means. And he's currently under DACA, uh, the Deferred Action for Children Childhood Arrivals Program. Uh, he took his Shahada in 2018, and he's been active in the Muslim community and served as the outreach chair for the, his university's Muslim Student Association. And he's just involved in civic justice. He graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago in May of 2020 and will be starting law school at Chicago Kent this fall. All of this is just so exciting. Salam alaikum and welcome. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for having me. Oh, so I got my, my 9,000 usual questions. <laughs> Many folk who have not been involved have never known what the DACA program is. When Trump was in office, they saw young people, and some of them even joined without really understanding everything that was going on with the program. Can you first tell us a little bit about the program itself. Right, so DACA, which stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, uh, was first introduced uh, under the Obama administration. And what it does is it provides some sort of protection for a uh, specific class of undocumented individuals here in America. And so there are requirements, for example, um, having that the individual must have entered the US before 2007, um, also either be uh, enrolled in high school or have graduated high school or a GED um, or be in the workforce or be in the armed forces um, and then also have a clean criminal record. And there are a, a bunch of other requirements that come along with it. But one of the or some of the benefits um, that come from individuals, uh, recipients of DACA is that they receive a valid Social Security number. So they're able to oh, legally. Okay. Um, they aren't able to get any of the benefits from social security but they still pay into the system but they're able to work legally here in the u.s um and then because of that in some states they're able to obtain a legal driving license um, and be able to operate vehicles legally um and then also they're at the bottom of the list of priority for deportation so it's not why are they at the top of the list for helping get documented that's a very good question so they are when it comes to all people that don't already have a path to citizenship. So DREAMers, um, which is a more broad statement that includes DACA, but that includes individuals that might have fallen short of some of the requirements, um, but they were all brought here at a young age. Um, they're usually considered at the high end of priority for if there is to be any immigration reform. Um, but for right now, at least, that for DACA, like I said, we're at the bottom of the priority list for deportation, which means that individuals are not guaranteed protection from deportation, but they're at the bottom tier. So as long as they're able to uh, stay away from any legal issues um, and go ahead and keep renewing their DACA protection, which is every two years, then they're able to live a semi-normal life compared to uh, a lot of other undocumented individuals here in America. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I did take the course in immigration law, and it seems like all of the requirements that a DACA individual has to 
fulfill are the same requirements that one would have to fulfill to become uh, a citizen. So right. what is the darn difference? I mean, the darn difference is that, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot. Um, it ends up being, unfortunately, that the undocumented community as a whole, but then you have dreamers and then more specifically DACA recipients have always been used as a political pawn. And so you have um, either side of the spectrum, either promising to deport or promising to create a path to citizenship. Um, but there hasn't really been anything tangible in the last over two decades with, for immigration. So like you said, all of the requirements happen to be the same and sometimes even more than individuals that become residents and then citizens because a lot of them might do it either through marriage or have family members that are able to help them go through the process or obtain some sort of visa to come in legally and then go through the process. But um, for DACA individuals, it's a very, very strict and specific uh, set of requirements. And so we're expected to be role models um, in, in society, which is not a bad thing, but that means that there's a higher bar for less protection um, when compared to individuals that have some sort of other legal way to, to residency and then citizenship. That's crazy. I mean, because you have citizens who couldn't qualify to be a citizen, you know, under under any kinds of um, circumstance. But what has that meant? Say if you, so can you get on the path to citizenship? Or is it the program that prevents you from getting on the path unless there's some uh, extra legislation? So the program neither um, helps really or prevents someone from becoming a citizen. So it really mm -hmm. depends on what their circumstances are outside of DACA. So for example, like I said, um, some people, if they are, if they end up marrying someone that is a US citizen, they can go through the process that way. Then there are other ways for sometimes siblings or parents to, or like siblings that are US citizens or parents that are US citizens to then help the children. Um, mm -hmm. But as time goes on, um, they get harder and harder with the requirements for that. And then one of the things that was introduced uh, over a decade ago, but was actually one of the reasons that I have not been, been able to become a citizen, um, is the 10-year ban. And so there is a 10-year ban that exists for certain undocumented individuals based on when they came into the U.S. Um, and all these other things. But what it means essentially is that if my sister that is over 21 and is a U.S. citizen was mm -hmm. ever to try to help me become a U.S. citizen, then we can definitely go through the process, but I would have to leave the country uh, for 10 years and not be able to come in um, until those 10 years are over. So it's like a punishment essentially for having come in illegally initially. Um, and so as, as I was growing up and same thing with my parents, which are also undocumented, it didn't really seem reasonable to start a process which costs thousands of dollars and takes months and months on end to then have to still go back to Mexico for 10 years and then rebuild a life there only to then in 10 years come back exactly. here. So it really defeats the- That's, an, that's an absurd requirement. Right. But right. I want to, to know a little bit more about, I don't think the average one of us has a clue that all of this costs money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, why don't these people just go get documented? You know, well, if they could just go get documented, they probably would. Right. But it's lawyers, it's fees, it's all of this. Could you explain just a little bit about that? Yeah. So, for example, specifically with DACA, and I'll, I'll start with DACA and then go to just like people that mm -hmm. the, the process of trying to become residents and then citizens. Um, but with DACA to apply, it's a 595 fee. So it's $600, um, to apply for it. And that's to the processing fee, all the filing fees. Um, and then when you first get it, you also have to pay when you get your social security number and then a few other smaller fees. And then that's also assuming that you apply on your own, which a mm -hmm. lot of us don't because we don't want to accidentally yeah. miss out a document or misrepresent or do anything that might get us into legal issues and then have it be declined, right? So 
you have a, at least a six hundred dollar um, uh, payment that you make, and then every time you renew it, which is every two years, then it's another six hundred. And so every two no, years, you're no, no, are you kidding me? No, I wish I was. Hannah, wait a minute. Like, can, can I ask you to hold that thought? Yeah. And let's take a brief break. Of course. Oh, uh, and we'll be right back. Uh, this is Dr. Amina Aldean, and I'm having a stressful conversation with Christopher Navarez, and we'll be right back talking about our undocumented neighbors. Billboards are popping up all over the country with an... Our neighbors don't realize that Muslims are absolutely opposed to ISIS. Salam. My name is Abdul Malik Mujahid. I'm an Imam in Chicago. 16 shots! No me! No justice! No me! So how do we bring up the energy which uh, can really have an impact on the world? You need to build bridges of understanding among people and we need to have America moving forward. That lesson learned has brought the strength of humanity to America, which is the diversity. Mujahid Talks, only on Muslim Network TV. Faithfully Connected. This is Amina Aldean, and I'm speaking with Christopher Navarez, and we're talking about some of the ins and outs uh, of this kind of limbo space of the undocumented. And he was just telling me that to apply just for the status is $600. Then they got all these little fees they're going to tack on, and every two years you have to go through it again. Oh my goodness. Right. Um, that's just for the DACA. Um, and so every two years it's that $600 fee plus any lawyers or any immigration um, expert that would be able to help you through the process. Um, but for individuals that go through the process of becoming residents and obtaining their green card, um, which includes actually some of my aunts, um, that takes thousands of dollars. Um, and that's for oh my all the filing that goes on. And then plus for that, you definitely need a good immigration attorney um, that's able to get you through that process. And then that's also just, that's assuming that you have the perfect application, right? That you don't have any other things that you might need to explain or um, add any additional documents that then would cost an additional fee. Um, and then at the end of that, at least for immigrants from a lot of Central and South America, which is the majority of them, um, then you have to then pay to go back to your home country um, and fly there and then meet, get to the U.S. Embassy, officially receive your green card and then come back into the U.S. And so that's another um, that those are other expenses that come into the process of trying to become a resident or citizen. Um, and so a lot of a lot of the times that's why some people hold off doing it because a lot of immigrants might not be in the, financial, um, in the financial place in their life to be able to just spend money like that, especially if uh, they have multiple people that are undocumented in the family, which usually is the case. Um, and so it's a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, um, and a lot of headaches to go through the process. And that's assuming that you can and you qualify under the requirements to apply to become a resident. I'm dumbfounded here because I'm thinking about, um, you have people, they're not fleeing for the hell of it. They're doing what the people who want to claim to be quintessential Americans did uh, in coming to this country and of course committing genocide, but they wanted a better life. They wanted the opportunity to work unmolested, right? Right. Now, <coughs> excuse me, you have people running for their lives and you expect them to have all these documents. Most people 
I mean, just don't walk around and in their purses or in their pockets have every document that there is for them. They may come from countries which don't require the same kind of documentation that we do here. I mean, we even today in 2021 have people born in rural parts of states where they don't even have a social security card which is the large issue with voting rights, right? Uh, you're asking, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's dumbfounding. That's, I mean, that's all I can say. I don't know how people can do it, but let me ask you a different question. How can we understand the person who is seeking asylum from the refugee, and I don't know that either of those is different from the person who is an illegal entry. Mm -hmm. So that they there are a lot of similarities when it comes to the difficulties of obtaining asylum or becoming a, a U.S. resident, but there are differences in um, the requirements. So, for example, asylees or those seeking refuge in the U.S. Um, usually do it from their home country or they come to one of the legal points of entry at the border and then apply uh, there formally. Um, and a lot of the requirements get very, very specific to what country they're coming from. If it's a war-torn country, if there are issues with gang violence or cartels um, or natural disasters, uh, a lot of that goes into play on how they're able to build their case to explain to the US government why they need to enter the US um, and explain why they can't go anywhere else, because that is one of the requirements. They have to explain why they're seeking it here in the US and not anywhere else. And that's a hard thing to explain sometimes when um, you're simply trying to just escape your home country and get somewhere safely. Uh, and then because the US a lot of times doesn't recognize a lot of the conflicts or uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, genocide or ethnic cleansing or other horrible, horrible things that are occurring in other countries because the U.S. doesn't always legally or officially uh, recognize that that's going on. Right. When right. individuals apply using that as a basis, they get denied because the U.S. government uh, doesn't accept certain reasons um, when it comes to coming into the U.S. Uh, and then it's again, it's it's very common for individuals to get turned around for missing one single document in their application and they have to refile. Um, and during that whole time, they're presumably back in their home country where where they're trying to escape, right? Um, a lot of times with children um, or individuals that simply can't defend themselves against, whether it be cartels, gang violence, soldiers, um, or any other sort of things or individuals that seek to harm them. Well, you know, it's very interesting because the picture that is painted for uh, viewers here is one is that these countries are just a hotbed of ongoing, unrelenting violence, rape, uh, I don't know, kidnapping, this, that, and the other. And I'm saying, well, that's not quite true. And I've interviewed uh, folk who are one young lady whose grandmom didn't want her to return. I think she was from Brazil, who uh, grandmom didn't want her to return to Brazil because uh, she wanted to see the land, you know, ancestral home. And she went there and her the the relatives there was saying, don't go out, don't go out, <laughs> you know, right. go out in a group. And I said, well, that sounds like Chicago. But, um, you know, this the, the picture that is painted here is this unrelenting, uh, the, the worst of the violence one could ever see. Whereas we in the United States, as you well know, have some of that same kind of violence in every city and every state that one could, could go to. And I don't, I still don't understand what papers, if you're running from somebody that wants to hold your 
a family hostage, how are you going to have all these papers? Right. Right. It's unfortunate. Uh, to put it easy, the U.S. a lot of times paints the rest of the world as, like you said, this war-torn, uh, crazy, crazy jungle, um, right. to put it lightly, when it comes to trying to explain America's greatness, right? And showing that we're the absolute best country in the world, but okay. at the same time turn a blind eye when we have individuals from those same countries that do have issues at a lot of times trying to come in and find a safe haven in a country that's been built by immigrants, by refugees, and by mm -hmm. uh, on the backs of a lot of people that um, unfortunately are still fighting for their rights or trying to find a place to just live safely um, and at peace with their family. Well, I think a lot of that, and I want you to think about it as we take another little quick break, a lot of the havoc and environmental and economic woes have their origins here in the United States. So I want you to think about it. And if you don't mind, we'll take another quick break. This is Dr. Amina Aldean. I'm having a very, very stressful conversation with Christopher Narvarez, and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum. I love Adam's world because it makes me learn in a fun way. That Adam has green, a green face and um, orange hair. I like this song. I like how Adam sings. I like Adam's world because it makes me... Because it makes me happy. What? No. No. Oh. And here's Adam and here's Anissa. Adam is and his sister. And Adam is a boy and he is very small. Download the new Adam's World app at adamsworldapp.com and let's help tomorrow's Muslims today. We are back, and this is Dr. Amina Aldean having a very stressful conversation with Christopher Navarez on Critical Talk for Muslim Network TV. We often on Muslim Network TV, and especially on Critical Talk, try to get to clarify better still what's going on. You know, th these countries did not just jump up one day and become violent. Somebody had to have a hand in what's going on. I mean, I watched a documentary on Chile, and one of the things they were talking about was taking the water from rural residents to feed avocados. And I'm saying, oh, where do avocados work? You know, we're going to uh, just, just wipe out people for avocados? Talk to us a little bit about what is actually going on. Right. So more broadly, um, when you look at a lot of the countries in different regions of the world that either have uh, ongoing wars or conflicts or ethnic cleansing, uh, unfortunately, usually the U.S. has some sort of connection to it, whether it be funding the government or backing mm -hmm. the government or rebel groups um, yeah. in it. Uh, and then you have other countries like Russia um, and so on also part of the conflict usually. And so it's a lot of proxy wars and a lot of moving of chess pieces. And unfortunately, those chess pieces end up being uh, innocent civilians and innocent families uh, around the world. And that can be said for any topic that you could think of when it comes to, for example, the Iraq war or the war in Afghanistan or uh, more currently what's been uh, it's been going on for decades. But um only really coming to the spotlight, at least here on social media and on the news kind of here is uh, the illegal settlements of the Israeli government on Palestinian land. Right. And there you have an example of the Israeli government, which is U.S. backed, U.S. funded, um, committing ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. And then the Palestinian people having to either die trying to defend their land or uh, find refuge in neighboring countries 
uh, or all around the world, really, because at this point you have, for example, Palestinians all over uh, the U.S. Currently, yeah. the largest population of Palestinians outside of Palestine is in Brazil, actually, because Brazil yeah, ago, was was open to receiving uh, Palestinian refugees. But that's just a, an example of what we hear that's going on right now. It's been going on. But there you really see how the rest of the world and governments and power players are really wreaking havoc uh, on innocent lives and then trying to blame individuals for these conflicts that are bigger than themselves. Well, let me put you in the role of a professor and say, you know, how would you even begin to explain these global dynamics that are, as you say, affecting the man that just wants to go to work and feed his family, keep a roof, you know, send some kids to school? I mean, the outrages, what was the, uh, one of the things was NAFTA, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember what that was, and it's escaping me, so you can tell me. And mm -hmm. then we have migrant workers who have always come here and picked the stuff we love to eat, you know, and they come, they make a little bit of money because the people paying them aren't paying them anything. And then you have the predatory banks in certain parts of California and other places. Oh, we got a bunch of migrants here. Let me do this. That They all need a credit card, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, what's going on? So I'll employ, I'm by no means an expert, but I'll try to employ my bachelor's in political science. So from what I learned and understand about just, um, especially here in the setting of the U.S., is you always have this uh, system of individuals with a lot of money and a lot of power. So what we would think about is like the elites uh, really using those that are above or under them in the economic and societal hierarchy and pinning mm -hmm. them against each other and causing these constant conflicts that they're able to um, benefit from either economically or politically. And a great example of that starting at the very beginning of uh, America and what has been America is uh, pinning of uh, enslaved individuals that were brought on ships and pinning them against the native population, right? yeah. Native Americans, and having them uh, explaining to um, the, or I'll backtrack. So we have those two groups being pinned against each other and um, the elites blaming the natives for the for the hardships that slaves have and then slaves and then blaming the slaves for the hardships that native americans have right so mm -hmm. basically trying to divorce themselves from being the actual perpetrators of harm to both of these populations and then you go on and then you have the um emancipation of slaves in america and then what happens is that for the elites decide to continue to uh, perpetrate this division by uh, convincing poor rural, especially rural, but poor white Americans at the time, that the reason for their poverty and for the violence and all these issues were the recently freed slaves, right? Mm. And so instead of the poor white uh, population looking to the top of the ladder and saying, actually, it's the people that are rich that are keeping us poor, then mm -hmm. turning to the easy thing to do, which is uh, a lot of racist thoughts and biases and prejudice against the recently freed um, population of slaves. And then that's been going on, you, that happened to the Irish, that has, that's essentially happened to every single wave of immigrants that have come mm -hmm. into the US. They become the new scapegoat and the new, um, uh, basically like the the boogie monster right like to just yeah. to explain to the poor the um the disaffected individuals in america that it's actually the fault of the new immigrants that are coming in and they're the reason that everyone is still poor people still don't have a lot of basic necessities um and so again that's just been going on and right now it's refugees that are the scapegoat and um immigrants especially undocumented individuals that uh, the elites, again, keep pointing the finger at to explain all of these 
problems that exist in the US only because they don't want to go ahead and take ownership or admit that they're gaining some sort of benefit, whether it be um, very low pay for uh, unskilled labor work in farms all over the South um, mm. that undocumented individuals do, or mm. uh, all these other uh, social programs that people are excluded from, right? That just ends yeah. up in the US a lot of money at the end. Well, let me put you, let me put a different set of shoes on you. Mm -hmm. Since you're going to be this wonderful lawyer mm -hmm. that I can call on in my young age. Um, every sovereign nation has to have rules for who belongs, who doesn't, who can come in and stay and benefit and not. Many of the countries in the Muslim world have no right to immigration. You can become a resident, but you can't become a citizen. So now here we are in a diaspora, so to speak, and we're wondering, uh, and, and Muslims are on both sides of the fence, you know, uh, but not, and not taking seriously the fact that no Muslim country will let you, I don't care if it's 10 or 20 years, <laughs> become a citizen, you can become a resident. Mm -hmm. We and the Muslim world is in extreme turmoil. So while everybody that comes uh, to the border is not Mexican, and I think I've explained that at least a thousand times, but there is no understanding there is America, which is uh, synonymous with the United States. And there's a whole nother continent that nobody ever thinks of that has states. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have folks, the Uyghur, the Rohingya, the Palestinian, all of these people uh, running from uh, same, in some instance, instances, and in other instances, a different kind of horror. How do we, as Muslims, begin to think about this in productive ways? Mm -hmm. So I would have like what many would consider um, at least currently still like a more radical view on just immigration. And so I believe that there should be an eventual just open border policy around the world. And the reason that that oh. sounds extreme to many is because we think of all the issues and conflicts that are occurring around the world, right? And we always go to that first thought that if we just have open borders, that means that everyone around the world is going to want to come to the U.S. and we're going to be overpopulated, yeah, no resources, yeah. no money, no uh, freedom, no anything, right? Um, and, of course, there would be a lot of individuals that would want to come to the U.S., especially mm -hmm. um, if they come from countries that are really, really struggling. But uh, there are plenty of other countries that people seek refuge in. Uh, and so the U.S. isn't this, like, isn't really the only option. But having that goal of an eventual open border system around the country or around the world would really push countries that have the infrastructure, the money, and the power to try to help other countries around the world. For that same well, wait, wait a minute. Let me let me ask two yeah. things. Number one, people don't come to countries that have no resources. No. There's not a, a double long line of people trying to get to Senegal or the Congo, right? They want to come to countries where there are benefits, whether it's a welfare system of some sort or another. And those welfare systems are paid for by citizens. Right, right. So, but I mean, why should I pay for another man and his family? I can barely take care of my own. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, that that same thought, which is very natural for all of us, uh -huh. comes, from, comes from the fact that there are all these other conflicts around the world. Yeah. That the U.S. and other countries that have the power to prevent or to help haven't, and instead have a lot of times exasperated and just made worse. And so, again, there'd be that incentive to make a more peaceful world, less conflict, less wars. Obviously, that doesn't mean that then every single country would be the same or would prosper in the same way, right? You have a lot of other 
uh, factors, for example, uh, the geography, where it's placed, the population, resources, all these other things that would really dictate uh, which ones prosper way more than others. But mm -hmm. at the base, you would have all countries with livable conditions. And so you might not have that long line, like you said, in Senegal, mm -hmm. other countries around the world right now. But the goal of having an eventual open border system would push countries to stop causing and wreaking havoc around the world because of that fear that everyone will then go to countries, the few that do have resources, right? Well, so that's, would you agree that that's some of what's happening now? Countries which were very friendly to immigrants, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, are finding that, oh my God, all of these people want to come, don't speak our language, want to live off of the small population that is supporting that infrastructure. What do you do with that? Because you have to admit, when people who are same language groups migrate, they migrate into their same language group, and then everything becomes that same language group, and they create a bubble. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is definitely still the case, because again, there are very few countries that accept refugees or immigrants mm -hmm. more openly. Um, and that also have the resources. So it's like this very specific group of countries. It uh, is. That you could the name. The ones that made money off of the countries that the people exactly. are fleeing. <laughs> exactly. So, you, so yeah. that's, again, uh, the mistake that we make sometimes of um, trying to then blame people that are coming into our countries, which mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I mean, as Muslims and just as individuals um, and humans, we have to remember that countries were created and they're drawn out very arbitrarily and have since the beginning of time, right? Since you've had states or governments or systems that resemble that. So again, this idea of people coming into our country and not speaking our language or our culture are mm -hmm. things that feed into um, a lot of this like xenophobia, bigotry, um, and this idea that somehow that others coming into our system will always debilitate it when we know from the U.S. as the perfect example that immigrants and groups coming into the to the U.S. have only really strengthened it and are the big reason why America is successful, right? America is built on the backs of slaves, of immigrants, of refugees, and of people that have long fought for their rights. And so this idea that we're just going to stop or this fear of it continuing to happen um again goes to like the xenophobia the bigotry or just like the preconceived notions that we have of other people which again that's not invalidating people's fears of um violence spilling into their country because again there are individuals that are in these countries that might be involved in gang violence cartels uh, extremist groups, that's definitely a reality, right? That's a reality that we don't want to escape. But the, then again, we have to remember that that's not exclusive or sorry, mm. that doesn't exclude the U.S. because the U.S., we also have problems that we face like that, right? In Chicago, in a lot of countries, and we obviously I don't want to just then say like, oh, blame cities be, for the problems that are existing, but we have problems of violence as well, right? But mm. We don't then think like, oh, what if Americans go to other countries? They might bring violence there. We don't worry about what we might be exporting when it comes to violence, when it comes to uh, just harm to others, and are always really concerned about what we're importing, which is something that we have to switch in our mindset. Um, because again, like I said at the beginning, at the end of the day, we are Muslims and we understand that all of these systems, all of these things are created by humans, but at the end of the day, we humans are created by our creator, right? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the best thing that we can do is coexist and welcome others and try to ensure that others are safe because only when every every place in the world is safe will we be safe, right? Exactly. If everyone is free. Can we truly say that we're free as a nation, right? Um, it's it's again goes to those those same mottos that we hear a lot of times at rallies or uh, whenever we're hearing about civic justice. Okay, we're going to take our last break. This is 
Dr. Amanal Dean and Christopher Navarez. We're trying to make the world a better place on Critical Talk on Muslim Network TV, and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. It's Adam's World. Believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah. Let's explore. This is Dr. Amina al -Din, and I am with Christopher Navarez on Critical Talk for Muslim Network TV. And we're kind of running the scope of ideas about immigration and DACA, and I, I want to run just a little bit with his idea of open borders and say that one of the things that bothers me is when I'm no longer able to speak to my neighbor when our values and mores are so different that <clears throat> they, I can't get to know them. You know, I can't grab their kid out of the street before they get hit by a car. Or, you know, I don't have enough language skills to tell them I saw somebody prowling around their home. What if, if we have open borders, and I say we have open borders and a shutdown of welfare. So um, going to that idea of, like you were mentioning, language or some of the barriers that might exist initially, um, again, mm -hmm. that's what I think it would be. It would be an initial um, possible struggle that would just occur, um, some like cultural clashes, but uh, there are plenty, plenty of examples um, during world history of groups that have um, come together and have learned um, basic communication, have learned to coexist. Um, and so I think that's what would naturally happen. And like you mentioned, for example, earlier, how um, a lot of times immigrants uh, that might share the same ethnic or cultural or national background um, migrate in groups, right? And so they might go to the same country and be living mm -hmm. in the same neighborhoods. Um, and that is a result of many, uh, many things. But what that would do again is it would uh, really, I think, naturally distribute communities um, that would come into these countries. And again, initially it might be a bit of a struggle, but at the end of the day, um, it's not something that should prevent us from working towards uh, a system where people have basic necessities. And if it is that in their home country or the area that they live in in a country is not providing that for them and they have no other recourse, then they should be able to easily go to another country and build a life there, right? And again, at the end, uh, countries, I believe, would adjust their welfare systems their economy uh, would naturally unfold in a way where um, people would be able to benefit and they'd be integrated into this system, right? Uh, well, suppose the countries just decide, okay, I'm going to open up the borders, but I'm also going to not have a welfare system because mm -hmm. I don't want the citizens to have something to use as a leverage against. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm paying all the taxes. Uh, they will eventually pay taxes, but not today. And uh, so let's just dump the welfare system mm -hmm. and you can come. I mean, any country definitely could do that. Um, mm -hmm. It'd be very wise, I would say, for any country that has an existing one to just uh, go away with what they have because of the backlash that they receive from 
um, like the the current citizens of the country. Obviously, there might be some that would say, I want to pay into the system um, for all these people that are coming in, all of these things that uh, or all of these issues that some might have. But there are plenty of recipients of some of those benefits that are citizens, that are residents of that country, that would definitely fight back and ensure that they have that well, system. They could also have a system which is only for citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's what currently exists in the U.S., um, mm -hmm. for example. And again, that is because of just the complicated immigration laws that exist so that you have this second class of citizens, which are undocumented individuals and refugees uh, mm -hmm. as second class citizens. And so an open border system would, I think, would um, erase that issue, right? Like you would no longer have these stringent systems based on citizenship because people are free to go from country to country as they please, um, assuming that they pass uh, or assuming they're not like, for example, like violent individuals or have some sort of uh, record that might prevent them from easily going from country. If, they, if you have open borders, people don't have to have papers. You won't know who they are. I mean, there there could still be a system of some sort of documentation, but then it would be more at a global level where people would be able to identify themselves, right? Um, but it wouldn't be the same as like the system that is now where depending on what country you're from, how old you are, your economic situation, you might be declined entry into a country, right? Um, open borders, I at least the way I envision it, isn't just this like free for all where no one has documentations of any sort. People are just like doing whatever they want, right? There would still be some sort of system for accountability if they do happen to commit crime, if they do happen to violate some of the rules that exist in the territory that they enter. Because at the end of the day, each group will still have power to create laws that are more in line with their values as a society. But again, laws that wouldn't exclude others for racist, bigoted, xenophobic, uh, whatever else uh, um, isms you could have against a specific group outside but of your- let me, let me push on that. Mm -hmm. So in your notion, what you see is countries wouldn't have wars because they wouldn't have boundaries. People who don't speak the language could not be held accountable for the law because they couldn't read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, again, I, or at least the way I envision it, it's the same as when people say uh, uh, abolish the police, right? Mm -hmm. Like it de on the individual really depends on what they envision that to be. Some might say right. that means no police at all. Others would say that means community policing. Others say that means reform, right? And so when I think about uh, an open border system, there would still be the countries outlined, right? People that decide that they want to, or people that are like in a group that would be able to self-govern, there would still be that sovereignty, but there would not be uh, these country specific laws when it comes to who can enter and who cannot just based on their ethnic, national, cultural background, if that makes sense. So you would still and would most likely still have countries. Um, people have never left, or at least humanity has never left that uh, natural inclination towards tribalism or towards mm -hmm. countries or wanting to live around those that share their cultural background. Right. That's totally a natural thing. Um, but an open border system would prevent groups from just uh, arbitrarily or subjectively declining the entry of specific groups just because they don't like the way they look, the way they speak, the way they act necessarily. Um, and it would have to be for more specific reasons that would be to the individual and not to a group, if that makes sense. Um, well, let me give people. you the last word on DACA. We have a couple more minutes. Where do you think DACA is going? Um, I would say only Allah knows, but it looks like we're at a standstill, which is very unfortunate. Um, and it's a very common reoccurring uh, same old story that we have. Um, we had the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the Obama administration. You could go back administrations past and there has always been that promise of uh, le um, immigration reform. Yeah. Uh, a citizenship or at least 
legal residency for individuals so that people don't have to fear deportation, um, especially if they're not involved in any sort of uh, crime or anything other sure. than trying to build a better life for themselves and their family, right? Um, so there seemed to be really good momentum at the beginning of the Biden administration um, during his campaign. Also, initially, uh, there has been immigration reform that has been approved in the House um, was months ago, and that's just been sitting in the Senate, right? You have the split Senate, uh, which is very unfortunate. And for, from my understanding, for most immigration reform, um, you need a filibuster safe vote. It's not just a simple majority. So to change the immigration laws, you would need those 60 votes, not just the simple 50 votes plus the VP, uh, which a lot of the, the things that are passing through legislation, that's how they've been doing it right now because it's split, mm -hmm. and a tiebreaker as uh, Vice President Harris, but you would need that 60 vote. That's the rule in the Senate. And so there- So it's going it, nowhere. Right, it doesn't seem very <laughs> clear that there are those 10 Republicans um, plus even Manchin, which is more moderate, but caucuses with the Democrats usually, but it doesn't seem very clear that there are those 60 votes that are needed. And so we're kind of just sitting. I know recently, uh, Chuy Garcia, Representative Garcia from, uh, he's actually from Chicago. Um, and actually, Panela, he's, uh, he immigrated and was born in Durango, the same state I'm from in Mexico. But he recently, mm -hmm. even in the last few days, um, put out a statement and spoke about him not supporting any reconciliation on a budget until something about immigration is included in that same resolution. So some sort of protection for specifically DACA recipients, uh, TPS, which is temporary protective uh, status. And that's for a lot of individuals that might come from Central America. Um, that's another specific class of immigrants and right. then farm workers. Uh, labor workers that are still undocumented or might have a temporary visa, but it would provide those three classes um, some sort of legal status, path to residency, path to citizenship. So he's been on the forefront and saying like, he's not going to support any resolution unless it includes that. But again, he's one of 435 reps. Exactly. 35 uh, Congress people. And so he really is only using the power of his voice as a representative, but it doesn't seem clear or uh, it doesn't seem likely that he'll be the one to turn the needle, especially when it comes to the Senate specifically, which is where the issues run when it comes to immigration. Well, at least he's speaking. Christopher, we're going to have to leave this issue only for a minute because there are lots of other questions. This is Dr. Aminar Aldean for Critical Talk on Muslim Network TV. And I have had a very stressful conversation with Christopher Navarez, but it's the kind of stress that we at Muslim Network TV welcome because we get more knowledge. Thank you. Asalaamu Alaikum.